Hi guys, so welcome to your week two lecture covering chapters one and two from Texts and Contexts, which you read for this week. Um, some students find these chapters from this book sort of a challenging read, so if you did, you're not alone and there's nothing wrong with you. Um, what I'll try to do here is just summarize what you read, add my own commentary, and just kind of clarify things so that maybe the reading assignments make a bit more sense and you sort of have a better understanding of what the course will be about. I hope. Um, so as I mentioned last week, this course is organized around um, critical perspectives or different types of literary criticism. Because the course focuses on analytical and critical writing, um, we will use literature as our subject matter and then in order to analyze and criticize literature, I'll be introducing you to a number of different kind of critical lenses that we can use to help us um, analyze literature. I hope you find it fun. A lot of students did last quarter um, when I used this book for the first time, so I hope you all like it too. Anyway, um, chapter one introduces you to the idea that there are many different ways to read a text. So there are all of these different kind of modes that you can be in when you're reading, say, a poem or a short story. Uh, you could be focusing on literary form, and if you were doing that, you would be doing new criticism. You could focus on the experience that you have as a reader, and if you did that, you would be doing reader response criticism. You could focus on um, the biographical details of the writer or the historical context that the piece grew out of, and if you did that, you would be performing, performing, I guess performing, kind of a strange word to use, um, historical or biographical criticism, and so on and so forth. There are many different critical perspectives that are covered in Chapter 2, but um, maybe this sort of helps you get the idea of what, you know, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 are about. Anyway, in order to give you a better understanding of what these critical perspectives are and how they might uh, allow you to kind of analyze a piece of literature in different ways, the writer of the book, Stephen Lynn, has given you this very strange and intriguing, I think at least, picture of um, Ernest Hemingway and Fidel Castro in chapter one. And then after he kind of gives you this picture, photo, uh, he analyzes the photograph, he goes on to analyze the photograph in a number of different ways. So he considers, for instance, why the two men are standing so close together. So what does that, you know, signify? What might that mean? Are they attracted to each other? Is it cultural? Um, are they close talkers because they're just idiosyncratic and strange? Or are they close talkers because this is somehow appropriate in the culture that they're part of or the cultures that they're part of? Um, and he examines the you know background that the two men are standing against. He thinks about what that background might represent or symbolize about the various countries that they're from, that the men are from. He examines even that kind of woman that's in the middle of the picture who you might not even notice, that little face that's between the two guys. Uh, anyway, he just sort of examines all these different facets of the photo and in doing so he shows you that there are many different ways to interpret some kind of an artifact of culture, whether that's a photograph or a poem or a painting or whatever. We're not going to focus on um, paintings and photographs in this class, we'll focus on poetry and fiction primarily. But um, you can think of what we're going to do this quarter as similar to what Stephen Lynn does following the introduction of this photograph. We'll take a piece of literature and we'll think about it from a bunch of different perspectives and you'll get to try on some different sort of critical lenses, <clears throat> so to speak. Okay, onward. So another thing I wanted to mention that Stephen Lynn um, kind of talks about in this chapter, but that I'd like to really underscore, is that critical perspectives or critical um, types of critical theory are about what you do as a reader. They're not about what a text does. So while some texts might uh, lend themselves better to say biographical criticism or psychological criticism than others, the text itself isn't a biographical criticism text or a psychological criticism text. In theory, you could apply any of these different critical perspectives to any piece of literature and it would work. So um, I just wanted you to be aware of that. The text itself is just a text. A poem is just a poem. A short story is just a short story. The critical perspectives we'll be using and cycling through in this class are sort of like different ways of looking at those poems and short stories, but they're not what the poems and short stories are. They're the ways that we're interpreting them.
if that makes any sense. And if you're not quite sure about that, if you're skeptical of it, I hope it becomes clearer as the quarter progresses and as we start to use these different types of um, literary criticism. Um, also, in this introductory chapter, Stephen Lynn sort of mentions that there are many different ways to interpret a literary text and that that's okay. Uh, there are wrong ways to interpret literary texts but those are only ways that are not grounded in the text itself. So if you're making up things about a poem that in no way are grounded in that poem and you're kind of just, you know, talking about stuff that's unrelated to what's in the poem itself or if nobody could ever find evidence in the poem you're writing about or talking about um, for your interpretation, then that would be said to be perhaps a wrong interpretation. But otherwise, the only real rule of literary analysis and interpretation is that your interpretation must be grounded in the text itself. Also, one thing I should mention, just as a little, I guess, aside, is that when I say text in this class, I mean something we're reading, generally, and I also usually mean a poem or a short story. Text is easier than saying, saying text is easier than saying continuously poem or short story, but also the word text um, opens up whatever we're looking at to include visual uh, art as well as written art, um, because a lot of these theories that we'll be using in this class can be applied to a number of different artifacts, not just poetry and short stories, but visual art and um, any artifact of culture as well. So chapter two is kind of a beast, as you may have noticed. There's a whole lot of stuff in there and it's a lot to remember. Fortunately, you don't have to memorize it. You can think of it as an outline of the book itself. Um, it introduces you in a very brief way to every critical perspective or every type of critical theory that we'll be using in this class, and that's included in the book. So each chapter, um, each type of critical theory has its own chapter in the book. For instance, chapter three is about new criticism. So you're introduced to new criticism in chapter two, but then you get a whole chapter about it in chapter three. And so we'll be spending you know, a week or so on each of these chapters. That might not be true, actually. Sometimes I think we're reading two chapters in a week. I just realized as I was saying that. But anyway, um, I just wanted to kind of reassure you that this chapter two isn't the only time you'll be encountering these types of criticism. We'll focus on them um, extensively throughout the class, and so this chapter is just an introduction to all of the types of criticism that we'll, we will be focusing on. So, let me see here. I already mentioned that critical perspectives can be applied to um, any literary work, that some work be better than others for, for particular literary works. For instance, you might find that um, post-colonial criticism works really well for one piece of literature, but you kind of have to really shoehorn it in to make it work for another piece of literature, in which case you just maybe wouldn't use it for that piece, and that's okay. But in theory, you could use any of these critical perspectives for any literary work. And just keep in mind, as I mentioned before, that the critical perspective you're using is your perspective, not the perspective of the text or the perspective of the writer. So a writer doesn't write a new critical text. You're performing new criticism. There, I said it again, performing, how strange, as you're uh, reading and interpreting a poem or short story. Also, these critical perspectives that are outlined in chapter two can be combined. Um, and often you might find yourself kind of gravitating toward combining them. I've had students combine new criticism and feminist criticism or psychological criticism and historical criticism or whatever. So it's not that you have to like choose only one necessarily and just use that one in isolation and, and so forth. So the first type of criticism that's covered in chapter two is what's called new criticism. You might also hear it referred to sometimes as formalist criticism, and I think there's a little blurb at the end of um, the section in this chapter about new criticism going into and detailing the differences between new criticism and formalist criticism. For our purposes, we can kind of think of them as being the same thing. Basically, new criticism is a type of literary criticism and a type of literary analysis that examines a literary work, so a poem or a short story or whatever it is you're reading, as an artistic object that exists in its own right apart from the context in which it was produced. That is to say, when you're doing new criticism, you kind of ignore context and you just focus on the literary work as um, an object that can be analyzed and interpreted as a self-contained whole. It exists in its own little biodome. I don't know. That's kind of, I'm getting goofy, I guess. Um, I had a professor once, many years ago, who used to explain new criticism like this, and I thought it worked pretty well. Um, doing new criticism is kind of like 
examining the mechanism that makes a watch work. So a watch says something on the surface, it tells time, and much like a poem or a short story says something on the surface, it communicates an idea. But to really understand how the watch works, you would have to sort of like take it apart, examine the mechanism inside of it, and really see how it produces that time on its surface. And New Criticism, similarly, sort of takes apart a poem or a short story or a piece of literature and examines it and analyzes it and unscrews all of the little doodads and gears and I don't know, I haven't ever deconstructed a watch. But the point is, um, what you're doing is taking apart a piece of literature and looking at the way it was constructed in order to figure out how it achieves unity and how it communicates what we might call thematic meaning or an important abstract idea. So the type of uh, the modus operandi, I guess, of new critics is typically a close reading. So you just sort of would take a poem and you would go line by line and look at how each line is constructed, what literary devices are there, um, whether there is rhyme or meter in the poem, um, whether there's imagery, whether there's personification, sort of like what's going on in the poem, how does it work, and how does the way it how does it produce the meaning that it produces? Um, so examining a poem or a short story closely to figure out how it says what it says is new criticism. Also, I should mention, um, while I'm thinking of it, that at the very end of your book, I think inside the back cover, yep, I'm looking at it right now, and I see it's inside the back cover, there's an overview of the critical strategies in this book. There's a little chart, and a lot of students last quarter found that really helpful. So for new criticism, for instance, there's a list of three assumptions that new critics make, there's a list of three practices that new critics engage in, and there's a list of three questions that new critics might ask of a literary work. So when it comes time to write your first essay in this class, or even when it comes time to write uh, discussion posts, you might kind of refer to this chart and find it useful if you kind of get paralyzed and think, ah, I don't remember what it is I'm supposed to do. How does reader response criticism work again? I don't remember. Um, even when you're taking a quiz, you might find that useful. So I thought that was worth mentioning. The second type of uh, new what the second type of criticism that this chapter covers is reader response criticism, which can sort of be thought of as the opposite of new criticism in a way, um, in that new criticism focuses exclusively on the text and how it makes the meaning that it makes. Um, reader response criticism focuses on you. Um, in a way, and so it focuses on the experience of the reader, the experience that the reader has when reading a text. I mean, it's about the text in that you're reading something, but it's more about your own personal response to it, or it can be. Um, so reader response criticism can detail your own personal response when reading something that might be different from other people's responses because you're your own person with your own set of ideals, um, ideals and ideas and experiences, and you bring your own baggage to the poem or short story, I suppose. Um, but reader response criticism can also try to imagine just the general experience that the text seems to want you to have. So what kind of experience does the poem or short story seem to want the reader, people in general, to have when reading it? Um, and that can be kind of hard to figure out because who knows what general people might experience when reading something. Are there even general people? I don't know. Anyway. Um, you can also think about when you're doing reader response criticism, what kind of experience the writer seems to want you to have. So are there particular emotions or thoughts that the writer seems to be kind of um, spramping into your head? I don't even think that's a word, but anyway. Um, so reader response criticism in a lot of ways is really different from new criticism. Structuralism, th there's a section in our chapter two that's about structuralism and deconstruction and they're paired together and the reason for that is that structuralist criticism kind of isn't really a thing anymore at least. Structuralism usually gets covered and it's covered in our book because it lays the foundation for deconstruction. So deconstructive criticism is a big deal or at least it was in the 90s when I was in college. Um, now I guess it's still a big deal but it's not like the hot new cool thing like it was um, when I was a student. But deconstruction um, is something that's, that's based on structuralism in a way, but also it takes structuralism, it tears it apart, and it turns it on its head. <clears throat> so it's important to understand structuralism before you try to understand deconstruction, because deconstruction is hard enough um, to understand without sort of getting where it came from. 
So anyway, with that preface out of the way, um, structuralism is sort of a theory of language and linguistic meaning that was uh, created by Ferdinand de Saussure, and he was a Swiss linguist, I believe. Anyway, the two basic tenets, I guess, of structuralism are that linguistic meaning is arbitrary and linguistic meaning is differential. So it's arbitrary in that um, Saussure thought we arbitrarily link sound and meaning together. So for instance, a dog is called a dog. We have a signifier, the word dog. We have a signified, the dog itself. Um, there's an etymological origin of the word dog. We can go back and trace its origins. I believe it's a Germanic word. It probably comes from Old German. At least it sounds like it does. Um, I don't think it comes from Latin. I think canine does. But anyway, you could go back and you could look at like the first time the word dog appeared and where it came from and whatever. But there isn't like a deep meaning um, behind the word dog. It isn't like the word dog sounds like a dog looks. It is an automatopoeia, a word that sounds like what it is, like bark or scream or um, jingle or whatever. It's a word that just kind of means what it means. And so there's this arbitrary link, a link with no real rhyme or reason behind it, between an idea or a thing and a word that we use to represent it. And the other part of linguistic meaning for Saussure was that it's differential. So difference is what produces the meaning of words. Um, without <clears throat> the word day and the concept day, we would have no word or concept for night. So day and night are kind of a pair, and their, their meaning is created out of their difference. Um, and a lot of words work like this. The more you look for this in our language, the more you'll find it. So we have paired opposites or binary oppositions, as they're called, such as happy and sad, man and woman, up and down, light and dark. Um, we have all kinds of words that are, um, their meaning is created because they uh, have an opposite, sort of. And so that's where deconstruction comes in. There was this French philosopher named uh, Jacques Derrida who died, I don't know, wasn't that long ago. Well, I guess it was a pretty long time ago. I'm just getting old. I think it was my first year teaching, maybe 2003, 2004. He died a while ago. Anyway. He was this French philosopher and he took structuralism and he sort of like just blew it up and changed it and made it all weird. And what resulted from that is what gets called deconstruction. And so deconstruction is kind of a methodology of analyzing literary texts. Um, and it's not just taking a literary text and picking it apart. When you hear about something getting deconstructed in everyday language, typically that just means something is getting torn apart into little pieces and analyzed or if you hear about deconstructed clothing, it's like clothing that's all torn up and weird and strange and sewed back together in a weird way, I think. Um, that's not what deconstruction is in literary language, in literary speak. If you hear about deconstruction in an English department, um, it means something different. So um, deconstruction is based on this kind of joke in French that Derrida thought up, which I don't know, probably is only funny if you speak French, which I don't. Um, he had this term, difference, so you'll see it there in the PowerPoint that I'm looking at with you, D-I-F-F-E-R-A-N-C-E. -E. There's a little accent, I believe, over the E, but I couldn't figure out how to put that in because I'm not super um, good at making PowerPoints. But anyway, difference is a, is a hilarious joke in French, apparently, because it means two things. It means that things differ, like they're different from each other, but it also means that things are deferred or put off. So if you like defer your student loan payments, you put them off. Anyway, back to the story here. Um, Derrida thought that linguistic meaning, because it's arbitrary and differential, you know, is created out of difference, but it's also always deferred. So for instance, we have this pair of opposites, this binary opposition, day and night. The meaning of day is always deferred to night or put off to night because without night, we'd have no day. So day doesn't just mean anything in isolation from the whole system of language. It means something only because it has an opposite. And so in a way, its meaning is deferred to its opposite. So your mind is probably like exploding right now. At least mine was the first time I heard about this. I couldn't stop thinking about it for days. Um, because what this really means is that a word can't contain its own meaning. Its meaning is always located somewhere else. So you try to pin down the meaning of evil and you can only go back to good because evil doesn't mean anything by itself. It only means something if we also have good. So in a way, 
is evil good? I don't know. It's weird. Roll it around in your mind for a while. Um, so for Derrida, words were kind of like, uh, you know when you go look at the night sky and you look at a star and out of the corner of your eye it's really bright, but then you try to stare at it and you can't find it anymore. It's like gone when you try to look at it. That's kind of how linguistic meaning was for Derrida. Once we try to really pin it down, it always slips away. So anyway, this is kind of like, all right, it's cool philosophically, but it doesn't really matter until you start thinking about how in a binary pair in our language, there's always one that's the default or like the good one, I guess, and the other one that's the other or the one that's like non-standard or kind of underprivileged, I guess. So we think of day, for instance, as the good twin and night as like the night, the bad twin kind of, the like, not evil twin, but the the marked category, the other. Um, or we think of like good as being the standard and then evil as being the other, you know. Or even when it comes to men and women, arguably, we tend to think, okay, man is the standard, woman is the like other, kind of. So for Derrida, this was really interesting and had political implications because if we have these pairs of opposites that are sometimes politically charged or that sometimes have morality wrapped up in them or ethics or ideals or values, Really what this means is that um, even what we think is good depends on what we kind of think of as not good, or what we think of as standard kind of depends on what we think of as non-standard. So this has all kinds of implications for people who are interested in theories of gender and sexuality and culture and religion. And anytime we have people saying like, well, I'm right and you're wrong, or I'm, you know, I'm standard and you're non-standard, or I'm normal and you're deviant or whatever, um, this kind of thinking becomes really interesting for people who are who are into stuff like that. Um, and when it comes to analyzing literary texts, this theory has a lot of potential as well. Um, basically, what you do if you're performing new criticism, oh my goodness, I can't stop saying performing. It sounds like you're acting it out on stage or something, which, I don't know, I guess you could do that. Um, if you're doing new criticism, what you're doing is you're looking for how a text achieves unity and how it achieves meaning, communicates meaning, if you're doing deconstruction, what you're really trying to do is to show how there are these binary opposites or paired opposites of ideas in a literary text and how they produce some kind of an irresolvable contradiction, um, some kind of a gap in meaning that can't be reconciled. So a text seems to be communicating that um, love is good, but it also communicates that love is bad. And we can't reconcile those two statements. It's saying both things at the same time. But it can't be both. It has to be one or the other. So meaning breaks down and slips away, and everything is terrible, and it's kind of cool at the same time. We'll talk about this a lot more in a few weeks, but that's just a little like introduction to deconstruction. Um, you can tell I like it a lot. I hope you do too. So historical criticism, post-colonial criticism, and cultural studies are also all grouped together in your um, chapter 2. And uh, I think they're, chap they're grouped together in chapter two because they all are about the context that a literary text grows out of. Um, so historical criticism does what you think it would do, I suppose. It uses historical context um, in order to illuminate a reading of a text or an analysis of a text. So it's not a replacement for analysis. Instead, it's a way to enhance analysis. You think a text means something. You're curious about, you know, why the writer was interested in that idea or what the historical context was for that idea. You research it a little bit and you find that like, oh, there's this big historical event, a big war that seems to have influenced the writer. So you're still analyzing the text, but you're also including a bit of historical or biographical detail. Um, Post-colonial criticism is a type of criticism that you may not have encount encountered before, and it's grounded in a whole body of literary theory and um, you know, philosophical ideas and all that kind of stuff. Um, Post-colonial criticism views a text through the lens of colonizers and the co and colonized peoples um, in order to describe the relationships and texts growing out of such relationships. So post-colonial criticism is interested in texts that come from places that have been colonized. So you have a group of people living somewhere, you have another group of people that comes and like takes over sort of and says, no, this is my country now. And then you have these two groups of people who are encountering each other. And there's this kind of strange relationship between people who were colonized, people who are the colonizers. And this produces some interesting um, relationships. And then the texts that are written by people living in that place 
kind of contain traces of those relationships. So post-colonial criticism um, kind of seeks to examine those relationships and how they might have influenced the, the writing of a text. Cultural studies is a whole big discipline that is not just in English departments. It, it's kind of interdisciplinary. So you can get a degree in cultural studies and if you do this, you're doing a little bit of English and a little bit of philosophy and a little bit of history and a little bit of um, this and that. So you're kind of like doing all of these things at once. Basically cultural studies as a type of literary criticism though, um, views texts, so poetry, fiction, whatever, as the product of culture. Um, and in doing so, it kind of criticizes not only the text and analyzes not only the text, but also the culture itself. So cultural studies sort of sees all cultures as separate but equal. None is better than another. No one is better than any other one, if I can say that in a grammatically correct way. Um, and, and so it kind of looks at all of these different cultures as like separate but equal and so in examining a text as the product of culture mm -hmm. cultural studies critics I guess feel equipped to point out like the shortcomings of a culture or the cool ideas that a culture might have or or whatever um, so psychological criticism is a type of criticism that applies psychological theories to literary texts and it typically uses Freudian psychology um, as the basis for its like theoretical perspectives, but not always. I mean, it sometimes uses, um, oh goodness, I'm blanking. What is the name of the guy who, I don't know. Anyway, I'll come back to it in a second. Sorry, I just had a little brain fart there. Um, Freudian theory is typically used, but not always. There are plenty of other um, psychological theories that psychological criticism might use. Um, in, in doing this, in using psychological theories and applying them to literary texts, um, a psychological critic might pay attention to the mental state of the writer or think about what the mental state of the writer might have been, what we can glean about the mental state of the writer from the text. It's easy to start making up things though, so you have to be really careful about this and not just assume that because a writer is writing about, you know, a devastating love affair or something that that writer is depressed. You have to sort of like be careful about this. Um, psychological critics might also pay attention to the um, mental state of the speaker in a poem or the narrator of a short story or a novel, um, what we can tell about the mental state of this speaker or narrator. Um, uh, psychological criticism might also pay attention to the mental state of a character in a short story or in a novel or even the reader, I guess. I mean, Stephen Lynn points this out in chapter two. Honestly, I had never really thought about this before until I started using this book because I've never done psychological criticism in this way, but psychological critics might pay attention to what psychological effects the, the text could have on the reader. And in this way, it might overlap with reader response criticism. So political criticism is kind of misleading. Um, I've had students just see the title of this type of criticism and freak out in class and think that we're going to have some kind of political debate. Um, not that there's anything wrong with political debate, but it's not usually the focus of this class. Um, so political criticism doesn't mean democratic criticism or republican criticism or like liberal or conservative criticism or like we're going to now perform a libertarian critique of this text. Um, political criticism is kind of more boring than that, but also less uh, stressful, so to speak. So political criticism just sort of means, the word political in this sense really just means representing the interests of a particular group of people. So political criticism um, might take the form of feminist criticism in that it represents the interests of women or examines representations of women in literature. Um, political criticism might be uh, a type of criticism grounded in queer theory, which we'll focus on in this class too. So anyway, political criticism is really just about examining the perspectives or the representations of a particular group of people in a type of, in a piece of literature. It's not about like voting for a candidate and then applying that to a piece of literature. I mean, I guess you could do that, but we're not going to do it in this class.
So there's this other approaches section of chapter two, which is sort of weird, especially since really the only um, notable type of criticism that's covered in it, as far as I can remember, is Marxist criticism. And Marxist criticism is kind of a big deal. Um, I might have put it under uh, political criticism, but I don't know. I guess it can, it can just be included here. Um, Marxist criticism also is not really, much like political criticism, is not really what it sounds like. So it's not about like being a communist and then applying the you know tenets of communism or something to a literary critique. You could do that, but that's not really what it's about. Um, Marxist criticism is grounded in the writings of Karl Marx, but more in the ones that were critical of capitalism or that focused on the interests of the working class, as opposed to the ones that were about like creating a communist utopia and overthrowing capitalist pigs or whatever. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm going to take a little drink of my coffee here because I'm choking for some reason. Excuse me. So Marx's criticism basically just looks at the ways in which social class, economics, and labor are represented in literature. So if you focused on the social class of a main character in a novel and how it affects his relationships with other people in the novel, or how it affects his life, or how it affects his worldview, you'd be doing Marxist criticism. <coughs> so whatever your political views, whether you're like extremely liberal, extremely conservative, somewhere in the middle, you can still comfortably do Marxist criticism. It's not really about your political ideology. It's more about just whether a text deals with, say, economics or labor or social class. It doesn't necessarily have to be about your beliefs or your... Um, political leanings. It can be, but anyway, I hope this helps with chapter two. If you have questions about chapter two, as always, feel free to email me or message me in Canvas. Um, we have a discussion forum this week. If you have questions about this chapter, there will be time for you to ask questions about it. I'll answer them as quickly as I can. Um, there's a lot of stuff in this chapter, so I hope that you read it and realize that I'm not expecting you to understand every word of it yet. I just wanted you to read this so that you'd have a sense of what's coming in the class, um, what to expect. So I hope week two goes well for you. Please stay in touch. Let me know if I can help you.